everybody, hope you're well. Today I will read from a book titled The Soviet Century, Archaeology of a Lost World by Karl Schlögel, published by Princeton University Press. People who didn't grow up in the Soviet Union have no conception of the Kommunalka, the communal apartment. Nadezh Kamendelstam, who grew up in an upper-middle-class environment in Kiev, was well aware of this, having been forced to spend her life moving from one communal apartment to another. She recorded in her memoirs, Future generations will never understand what living space means to us. Innumerable crimes have been committed for its sake, and people are so tied to it that to live it would never occur to them. Who could ever leave this wonderful, precious 12 and a half square meters of living space? Husbands and wives who loathe the sight of each other, mothers-in-law and sons-in-law, grown sons and daughters, former domestic servants who have managed to hang on to a cubby hole next to the kitchen. All are wedded to their living space and would never part with it. Even less could they imagine what is obvious to every Soviet person who hears the word Komunalka, the colloquial term for Komunalnaya Kwarshira, in other words, for the communal dwelling inhabited by people who had nothing in common apart from the fact that they were fellow occupants, neighbors, because they had been forced into sharing an apartment. It was an artificially created community of strangers living together, not for the short term, but for the long run, and perhaps even a lifetime. An emergency situation that became an everyday experience. This peculiar and specifically Soviet biotope was generally located in an older building construed before the revolution for well-to-do bourgeois families, their dependents and staff. In the best city districts, especially of St. Petersburg and Moscow, the generously sized and luxuriously appointed 6 to 12 room apartments provided a comfortable home even for larger families. Following the revolution and expropriation, however, members of the revolutionary class, workers, soldiers and peasants were accommodated there and divided the rooms up among themselves. Whole families shared a single room so that former upper middle class apartments became the residence for between 40 and 60 people who had to arrange their entire lives within these cramped spaces. To gain a rough idea of the scale of these social localities, by the end of the 1950s, around 25 million families in the Soviet Union lived in communalkas, huts or hostels. Until 1958, the communal apartment was the basic type of urban dwelling. In Moscow in 1960, around 60% of the population lived in communalkas or similar communal accommodations. In the 1970s, it was still 40% even after an accelerated building program. And as late as 1989, 23.8% of the Leningrad population still lived in communalkas. The end of the Soviet Union spelled the end of the communalka too. The last inhabitants were moved out of the old buildings, often by force, and relocated to apartments that the developer and uh, realtor, as speculators and estate agents are known in post-Soviet Russia, procured for them far out in newly developed districts. There they sit, dreaming of days which may not always have been happy, but were their lifetime. The disappearance of the communalka meant the disappearance of a social space that was at the innermost core of the Soviet way of life and that now, with its decay, can be seen as one of the sites, perhaps even the very laboratory, from which the Soviet people were born. 
It represented the permanent state of emergency that was everyday reality for those affected or surrounded by it. Ask for the book at your local bookstore. Thank you for watching and see you in the next video. Bye.